us. We're ready for our rock and roll specialist. We have Buddy, Holly, and the Cricket. We interrupt this program for a special news bulletin. Three young singers who soared to the heights of show business on the current rock and roll craze were killed today in the crash of a light plane in an Iowa snow flurry. The singers were identified as Richie Ballin, 17, Buddy Holly, 22, and J.P. Richardson, known professionally as the Big Bopper. The aircraft... It's the most famous tragedy in the corpse-strewn history of rock music. On February the 3rd, 1959, Buddy Holly died in a plane crash in the icy wilderness of the American Midwest. 37 years on, his loss is still mourned by millions of fans as the day the music died. The plane crashed in a lonely farmyard about 15 miles northwest of Mason City. Cause of the crash was due to inclement weather conditions. Buddy Holly is the father of rock music, perhaps the most influential popular musician this century. In a career lasting barely 18 months, he wrote and recorded a dozen indisputable classics of rock and roll. But his greatest legacy are the other young men, mostly young Englishmen, whom he motivated to become singer-songwriters in his image. To British teenagers like me, he was more than just a rock and roll star. When he toured Britain in 1958, it was as if a saint had come across the Atlantic to convert us with his holy relics, a high-buttoning suit, a pair of horn rimmed glasses, a Fender Stratocaster guitar. Even after all this time, I still shudder to remember what life was like here in the mid-50s, when the only pop music was a hangover from the Second World War. And shudder to think what it was like for me, the son of an unsuccessful seaside showman living on the end of Ride Pier. Buddy Holly was my first intimation that there were other things in the world. Glamour, style, optimism, joy. I've always wanted to find the real Buddy, go back to his roots and seek out the people who knew him best and have never talked publicly about him before. He was sort of quiet and shy and reserved at times, but when he was with his, his own little group, he could be pretty exuberant. And he lashed out at the girl, he hit the girl. And but it quickly quiet, quieted down, because that's not Buddy Holly's style. But even in the early hour of the morning, he had a sense of... He liked to laugh, and he liked jokes. I'm not saying that he was an angel, because I wasn't an angel myself. I don't have no wings either. But I'm saying that he was a great person and a great entertainer, and I would leave it there. And God bless Buddy Holly, and God bless all of his fans that still is loyal to his legacy because he was one of a kind, and I call him the Thunderbolt from Texas. This is a journey I should have made years ago. Don't ask me why I didn't. And the place Buddy Holly came from. Lubbock on the South Texas Plains, a city with only one famous son, and not much else but cotton, cattle, and Christ. Lubbock has more churches per capita than any other city in America. They call it the buckle of the Bible Belt. Buddy's family were typical of many struggling through the Great Depression of the 1930s. Poor, hard-working, respectable, devoutly Baptist. Not unlike the Joad family in John Steinbeck's The Grapes of Wrath. Buddy was born Charles Hardin Holly, spelt H-O-L-L-E-Y, in this simple wooden house on 6th Street, Lubbock, on September the 7th, 1936. This don't look anything like it did then. That was a vacant lot for the next two, two lots there. And the house is gone, of course. We had a cow lot back here in the back with a cow with milk for the milk and had some chickens. And, uh, I was 10 years old then. <laughs> and you didn't think you were going to have another brother? 
No, I didn't even know mother was going to have a kid. That's how naive I was at that age. <laughs> kids, kids no more now. Yeah. And she, she decided she was going to call him Buddy. Yeah. Uh, there was a kid at school that she thought he was such a cute little kid in, in my school room up there in the third grade. She said, if I have a, another little boy ever, I'm going to be sure that he's called Buddy. Yes. And uh, he was born in the house. Yeah, right here in the house. Buddy was the baby of the Holly family, petted and protected by his sister Pat and his brothers Travis and Larry. Didn't think he had any talent at all. Before we went in the Marines, me and Travis would played in some amateur contest, and um, he had a little violin, but he couldn't play it. And But Daddy insisted that he be on the stage with us. And so we said, okay, but let's put some grease on his bow so that it won't make any noise. <laughs> and, and we won the contest, and I think Buddy was the reason, because he was a cute little fella. He said, you never leave me, but he got that urge too long. Now he gets around the country like a steamboat. Never change his color, she just travels along last way more. These are the images of America I was fed by cinema newsreels in the mid-50s. A sun-soaked consumer paradise, opulent, confident, with not a black face in sight. At elementary school, Buddy met his first, some say only, true love, Echo Maguire. I guess I got to know him the best was the summer before we went into high school, although I'd been you know, with him in school all the way through. And Buddy used to come to my house a lot. They'd drive by in the afternoon or something. And my dad had built a ping pong table we had out in the backyard. And so we used to play ping pong a lot. And then we'd go get a Coke. Despite his scrawny build, Buddy was a keen outdoor type who liked hunting and fishing and carried a gun. But most of all, from the age of nine, he liked playing guitar. The only music for a Texan boy of that era was country and western, the music of white supremacy and old-time religion, the kind favored by his parents and grandparents. In 1953, a Lubbock disc jockey called High Pockets Duncan spotted the 17-year-old Buddy playing as a duo with 19-year-old Jack Neal. Buddy and Jack's Sunday party on Radio KDAV gave Buddy his first taste of celebrity. And it was here that he made his first ever record. We uh, uh, made an acetate record uh, of me doing a couple of songs that I had written. And uh, I was playing, as we were did on the radio show, I was playing rhythm guitar and Buddy was playing lead. And uh, I was doing the vocal on uh, both sides of the, of the acetate. And uh, I, I believe that, uh, that it had to be the first time he played on that on the record. Uh, Philip, this is actually the studio where me and Buddy perform. Pretty small. Uh, it's, as you can see, it's not very big. It didn't have all this in here, but uh, anyway, and the uh, uh, DJ was right across this window here, and uh, he would give us our cues between uh, our uh, uh, advertising and when we was going to sing and stop or start or whatever. And uh, we'd crowd as many people in here as we could. Standing. Uh-huh. Oh, yeah. From elbow to elbow. And then the rest would look through this window here from outside. I got a feeling of the blues, oh Lord, since my baby said goodbye. But his idol in country music was Hank Williams, who wrote his own songs and developed a yodeling, stuttering vocal delivery that his Texan disciple would one day push to new extremes. Though a radio star while still at high school, but he didn't much look the part. In his second year, he had to start wearing glasses. His vision was found to be 2800, certifiably blind. But Lubbock High, as at my own school, 
Boys who wore glasses were either swats or drips. Four eyes didn't become stars. We had a term that we used back in the 50s of going steady, and that meant that you just went with one person and that you had their ring. And um, Betty and I went very steadily together. You know, we had dates every week. There was one point in time where I did take his ring and we went steady just for a short time, but um, I wasn't real comfortable with that. Your relationship was very proper, wasn't it? You used to sit on this couch together. Yes. Yeah. Um, and uh, just explain to me, please, how long it was before he kissed you. Well, we dated for a year. Before he kissed you? Mm-hmm. I want you to take me Where I belong Where hearts have been broken I went to the Church of Christ and Betty went to the Baptist Church and both of them are fairly uh, legalistic, conservative churches. Their doctrines very somewhat but um, within my church we were really taught strongly that we should marry within our church so that was always kind of in the back of my mind that I would attend church with Betty on occasion and he went with me quite a bit we had a, a large active youth group did a lot of activities and uh, so he was a part of that they were like a West Texan Romeo and Juliet, the gulf between their churches as vast and unbridgeable as between Montague and Capulet. But by now, a new kind of music was seeping into Buddy's soul, one very unlike the sedate country and western he played at his high school social. Music he could only find in the part of racially segregated Lubbock, where young tabernacle Baptists were forbidden to go. We would go down in the black part of town and uh, listen to them play and sometimes we would uh, they would let us sit in and play sometimes and we enjoyed it it was something that we could feel in our blood especially buddy and people just didn't think that was a, a spot to be going and uh, our folks uh, wouldn't have approved of it at all do move. Do move. In 1955, at Lubbock's Fair Park Coliseum, took place an historic encounter. The young Buddy Holly opened the show for the young Elvis Presley. Elvis had only just started to mix white country and black R&B into the cocktail that was to blow the sleepy 50s apart. For a dollar and a half, the two founding icons of rock, together on the same stage. I've seen shows out here at this Coliseum, but I didn't get to see Buddy when he was here. But I helped seen him whenever he had a guitar in his hand. And it seemed like whenever he picked up a guitar, it, it just changed his whole personality. He just seemed like different, you know. Uh, he was pretty reserved and shy and timid. But when he got the guitar in his hand, it was different. And he could make the guitar sounds He had made different. some good sounds out of it. Uh, I've seen him take a guitar right out of another guy's hand, and it sounded like a different guitar when he was playing it. Colonel Tom Parker, Elvis's manager, was very impressed with him, I believe. I've heard it said that he made the remark that if he had run on to Buddy first, he would have hired him. But he had met Elvis a little bit before that. Elvis was not very famous then, and Buddy uh, was kind of his, uh, yeah, his, Buddy his friend. Buddy thought Elvis was great, you know. He, whenever he came to town, he wanted to be with him, and uh, I'm sure they, they run around some together. Yeah. Overnight, Elvis converted Buddy to a new religion, rock and roll. Oh, Reggie told the George's of an unemployment. He was sitting in the witness stand. The George's wife called him the district attorney. Better be that brown eyed man. She jumped and better be that brown eyed man. Flying across the desert in a TWA, I saw a woman walk across the sand. She's been walking 30 miles in to Bombay to reach a brown eyed man. Her destination was the brown Already I'm finding a character with two quite opposite sides. Shy, yet high spirited, polite, yet cocky, unpretentious, yet single mindedly ambitious. 
the good Baptist buddy would play his new Elvis-style repertoire at the Heidi Ho Drive-In, which sponsored its own radio show, hosted by Jerry Bo Coleman. 56 is probably when it first began. It was the Heidi Ho Hit Parade. It was on the air five nights a week from 9 and to 11 o'clock at night, you know. It ran for about uh, three years, I guess, you know. Pretty popular show. We had about 76% of the audience here in Lubbock. And that was people. sponsored by the Heidi Ho the Heidi Ho, Drive which we're sitting right now, and the proprietor of this establishment, by the name of Shannon Hughes, has been with the Heidi Ho for a long, long time. But that was the entertainment in Lubbock back then, just going around and circling, you know. That Driving was, around, right? Driving around, around, around yeah. that's right. And he played uh, on the roof. He did. That's exactly right. And we used to broadcast up there about uh, once every two months or something like that and take requests from people. They'd drive up in their cars, you know, and tell us what they'd like to hear, and then uh, we'd try to play it for them, you know, on a little broadcast. Mm -hmm. But anyway, Buddy liked to come up and get in the production room, you know, and get some of these old records out, or the current records that were being played at that time, Pat's Domino, Little Richard, Elvis Presley, of course, Gene Vincent, you know, and he'd listen to him, you know, back in the production room, and I tell you, he was really paying attention to what he was listening to. The wilder and more raucous buddy starred at Lubbock dives like the Cotton Club, outside the segregated and teetotal city limits, where black rock and roll stars like Little Richard played to mixed race audiences, high on brawling benzedrine and bootleg beer. You know, being a black entertainer back in that period, I wasn't allowed in certain places, but I would go into anyway because white people admired me and my music, but I've never gotten some of the rejection that some entertainers has received. Uh, uh, you got to remember that there's a lot of white entertainers was receiving the same thing because rock and roll, they didn't care what color you was. They didn't want their music. It was not a color thing. It was the music. They felt that it was satanic and they didn't want their children affiliated with it. You know, they didn't care who was singing it. Grandma, grandpa, black, white, red, brown, and yellow. It didn't matter. It was the music itself that they was not used to. To fulfill his grandiose ambitions, as always in time of need, Buddy turned to his elder brother, Larry. Where I was on the job working one day and said, Larry, I need some money. Uh, could you loan me some money? And he was just, you know, he was eager and, and patting his hands and... I said, well, how much do you need, buddy? He said, I need a thousand dollars. I said, good grief. Why don't you just ask for the moon? I said, you know, a thousand dollars is a lot of money. What kind of guitar are you going to get? You can give one for fifty dollars. And uh, yeah, well, I want a good one. He said, and I need to get some clothes. And I think I could make it if I had some clothes and could go to Nashville. I said, okay, uh, but I, I knew he was coming along pretty good with his music. And, but I didn't think he'd ever make it, you know, at Nashville or anywhere where real big. But I did loan him the money. And he went and spent $600 on that Fender Stratocaster. And then the rest he, he blowed in on clothes, you know, like a, a chartreuse jacket. I mean, it was lime green and, and some blue shoes that were suede and, and things like that. that I, I wouldn't have been caught dead in them, but he, he liked them, you know. In 1956, Buddy and his band, The Two Tones, won a recording session with the Decca label in Nashville, where Elvis had not long previously cut Heartbreak Hotel for RCA. Buddy's Decca tracks included one inspired by his favorite movie star, John Wayne. That'll be the day. But like his disciples, The Beatles, six years later, Buddy was rejected by Decca. A senior executive there called him the biggest no talent I ever worked with. I'm in the place where Buddy Holly found his salvation, Clovis, New Mexico, a state rife with legends of UFOs and alien encounters, all in all the perfect place to have created Norman Petty. Petty had a middle-of-the-road musical trio featuring himself on organ and his wife Vi as vocalist. He also operated a well-equipped independent recording studio. Here in February 1957, Buddy re-recorded That'll Be The Day, on Norman Petty's state-of-the-art Ampex equipment. 
The studio is still almost exactly as it was on that day. I get a feeling of life not ended, just interrupted. There were good vocalists and good guitarists. There were good engineers with good ears. But there was a unique combination here that Norman brought together. And in relationship to Buddy, was Buddy's voice, his enthusiasm, his love of the music, and Norman's equipment, and the echo chamber, and the feeling in here, the warmth. Always a family thing. There was a camaraderie. And that was the way Norman worked. But there were other sides to Papa Norman. Obsessively secretive, ferociously religious, egotistical, exploitative, with a smooth-talking veneer that made him seem utterly trustworthy. I was uh, amazed of the intensity and the very honest and sincerity of his whole approach to music. He wasn't necessarily the world's most handsome guy. He didn't have the world's most beautiful boy, voice, but he was himself. Here's a guy that had intentions, he had uh, ambitions, he was good, he was himself, and he succeeded. Staying at home, waiting for you. The humor and variety of the singing style Buddy developed in Petty's studio disguised the fact that his lyrics were sometimes hurriedly improvised. When we was going to uh, Chloe's to record, I'm looking for someone to love. But he had his guitar in the back and was trying to work up this song. He said, you know, it needs another verse. I said, say, I know something you can put in there. <laughs> I was just joking, you know. He said, what's that? And I said, drunk man, street cars, put slipped and there you are. How you like that? He said, oh, <laughs> he said, I thought you had a deal. <laughs> but he got thinking about it. He said, well, you know, that might fit. It'll meet her out. And he got put it in there and and first thing you know, he put it in the song. Drum man, street cops, foot slip, there you are, well, I'm looking for someone. Buddy's backing band now comprised drummer Jerry Allison, bass player Joby Moldin, and rhythm guitarist, and Buddy's third cousin, Nicky Sullivan. I joined uh, Buddy in actually about late fall of 1956, and um, a friend of mine, just hounded me to take my guitar over and join a jam session at Buddy's house, and I just I didn't I didn't have the courage. I uh, I was shy. I really didn't know what to expect. But my friend convinced me to put my guitar in the trunk of his car, and I did that. But I expected to keep it there. I really didn't feel comfortable playing music with Buddy Holly because he was so good. Oh God, he was good. Having already recorded That'll Be The Day for Decca, Buddy was prohibited from repeating it on another label. Petty came up with a typically secretive solution, hiding him inside a group name. We were at Jerry Allison's house, um, practicing, and had been practicing in the afternoon, and um, we knew the record was going to be released, and Norman had called Buddy to say, you need a name for the group. And uh, we had to come up with a name, and every name we could think of, which at the time was popular, were insects, spiders, and things like this. So Jerry reached over under a stand and pulled out a, a dictionary and opened it up to insects. And uh, so as we started to go through, we noticed that these names have already been used until we get to the name Cricket. And it said... Um, romantically referred to as making music by rubbing its hind legs together. Music, cricket. Somebody said, what about a beetle? Nobody's used that. And um, Jerry said, oh, that's a black bug you would step on. So we threw the name beetle out. I mean, we could have been the Beatles. We could have been the Beatles. If there had been anything musical about it, we would have probably been the Beatles. Even our friends said crickets. People say that lust for fools. Since Buddy's crickets were not up to providing background vocals, Petty brought in a phantom trio, the Roses, to sing the blurry oohs and ahs that became part of the Buddy Holly elixir. Oh, well, it's so easy. It's so easy, it's so easy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> 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 it's been too long. <laughs> it's so easy to fall in love. It's so easy to fall in love. Most of the time it was a day or two, sometimes a week after 
the Crickets and Buddy were in here doing the recording. Of course, we were we were here. We were in uh, in the back or in the control room, so we could get a feel for each song at that time. Then we would come back into the studio when it was quieter, uh, not so much going on, and we could uh, dub our voices in at the time. Normally, uh, Buddy would go along with just about anything that we thought of that would sound good with the song. And occasionally he would think something would sound better, and we would work on it, and that's the way it would go. And of course, sometimes Norman Petty would also make suggestions. But for Petty's studio time and expertise, there was a quid pro quo. His name, too, had to be on the songs Buddy wrote. When that'll be the day finally footslogged to the top of the charts, three months after release, it seemed like just another rock and roll one-hit wonder. Buddy had no idea whether the craze would last, as he admitted to a Canadian disc jockey. What do you think about rock and roll music? Do you think it is uh, on the wane or what? I think it's uh, going out quite a bit in the States. Down south? Uh-huh. How far down? Deep. <laughs> <laughs> it is, but I mean, how long do you think it uh, will last? Another six months, seven months? Oh, possibly, yeah. I think after Christmas, things may change a bit, though. Uh, they, 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 it, it might pick back up, but I rather doubt it. Well, I felt like we were kind of going in two different directions. I knew, you know, that music was his goal, and, you know, I was excited for him, but by the same token, you know, it was probably kind of pulling us apart. I can see how devastating it must have been for the good Baptist Buddy to lose Echo Maguire. The effect was to send the other impetuous Buddy ricocheting into an affair with a married woman, June Clark. He's said to have had a brief fling with Norman Petty's wife, Vi. I've even found evidence that he may have fathered a child by a girl he knew in high school. At the time when I officially joined what became the crickets. Um, Buddy was dating one girl, but he had been dating another girl. And um, they had had relations. And um, in fact, I was with Buddy one evening. And I'm sorry, I don't know all of the principals who were in the car, but there were, I think, five of us in the car, three in the back, two in the front. And Buddy and a girl were in the front. And she, and we were at the uh, Heidi Ho drive-in in, in Lubbock, and uh, she proceeded to throw up on the floorboard. Now this girl was pregnant, and she told us, I am pregnant. And Buddy lost it. I mean, it was something he did not expect to hear. He had just been kicked off of DECA. He was having a hard time. He didn't want to work at anything but music. And he lashed out at the girl. He hit the girl. And but it quickly quiet, quieted down, because that's not Buddy Holly's style. That was the reaction of a man being faced with something totally he did not need as a singer, as a, as a performer. You don't want to hear something like that in your life. And um, Buddy was hurting inside. He wanted so bad. He wanted it so bad. And to think that anybody 19, 20 years old could want something that bad it's understandable that they've got to have a little release of some kind and uh, he didn't hurt anybody didn't hurt himself but he was um, he was hurting and then I believe uh, later when you were on tour um, there was some evidence that there was a child going to be born or had been born yes we when we were on tour we did stop at a home for unwed mothers and there were four people there and then a girl and we were with buddy buddy was talking to her and the, the rest of us stood aside and let them have their conversation it was brief we weren't there five or ten minutes at the most um i do remember wearing coats so i feel that it must have been in late or fall or something like that where it was cool and he never mentioned anything about it afterwards no no we would Remember, we were been in that car, and she just blurted it out that she was pregnant, and this is the same girl. Absolved of responsibility, Buddy was free to join all the big names of rock and roll at the New York Paramount and be initiated into the new world of superstardom. Invited into Little Richard's dressing room, 
he was confronted by a gymnastic sexual orgy, which the reformed character of today is a little vague on. He was a gentleman, and he did what men would do. Not what women would do, but what men would do. He loved women, and that's what God made Adam to be with Eve, not Steve. And he, he was on the right track. He had the right act. I'm not saying that he was an angel, because I wasn't an angel myself. I don't have no wings either. If you knew. At the end of Buddy's first national tour with the crickets, Nicky Sullivan quit the group, suffering from exhaustion. The lineup wasn't all that changed. Buddy began the new year, 1958, with a complete makeover. New hairstyle, new caps on his teeth, new horn-rimmed glasses. His first trip abroad was topping the bill above Paul Anker and Jerry Lee Lewis on a tour of Australia, stopping off for concerts in Hawaii. With the crickets went Norman Petty, now their manager as well as producer, and his cine camera. It was more like a Sunday school outing than a rock and roll tour, thanks to Petty, who forbade his charges to drink, smoke, go with girls, or even swear. And between gigs, there were frequent impromptu prayer meetings. In Britain, we'd already had American rock and roll for a couple of years. But to teenagers here, it was something alien, rather intimidating, and completely untranslatable. You could barely understand it let alone attempt to play it for yourself. American rock and roll stars who'd come to Britain thus far had proved a severe letdown. When Bill Haley arrived by ocean liner and boat train in 1957, we could hardly believe how pudgy and stodgy and middle-aged he was. Well, that was at a time when the rock and roll shows were sort of coming in, infiltrating into variety as we knew it at that time. And my agent said, um, I've got another uh, uh, rock and roll tour for you to do. I said, no, thanks, because the kids are starting throwing real rocks. <laughs> as far as I was concerned, I'd go on there to do two performances. In other words, one in the first half, one in the second half. And most of the time, the kids weren't too happy about me in the first half. They want to see their rock and roll hero. And then he said, there's this guy called Buddy Holly. I said, I never heard of him. He said, well, you know, he's going to be very big. <laughs> Buddy and the Crickets arrived in March 1958 for a month-long tour that was to transform British pop music and illuminate the lives of thousands of bored and buttoned-up British boys like me. The British swing band leader, Ronnie Keane, was hired as an unlikely co-star. Out of the blue, I got this phone call from the grades. Would I like to provide a band to back Buddy Holly. And the show started off and the band played a couple of numbers, just sang a couple of songs, and then the kids were really waiting for Buddy Holly. And he came on the stage and the place erupted. It just completely erupted. We'd normally play variety theatres, and suddenly we were going to do a concert tour, and I thought, well, that might be, you know, might be great. And so I went up there and I stood in the wings the first night. I couldn't believe it. We had a, we had an orchestra, Ronnie Keenan's orchestra, frontline brass sax, real. You make a lot of noise, but when these guys come on, just three of them. It was amazing. We'd, n we'd never seen kind of amplified or heard amplified music like that. Very exciting. All of my love, all of my kissing, you don't know what you've been missing, oh boy. Buddy must have wondered what to make of it all, especially when the crickets were steered into a photo session with two test cricketers, Dennis Compton and Godfrey Evans. But despite the heavy-handed PR effort, most of us didn't realise he was here. I think he thought he was coming over to play on a, a rock and pop show. And uh, 
when he saw what was going on, it wasn't a, it wasn't a rock and pop show. It was a variety show. And uh, he accepted this because I think the grades were sort of hedging their bets. They didn't they didn't realise what they were getting into or what they were doing. They were bringing this man across from America, and uh, they hadn't got into the the uh, two or three hour rock and pop show. So they didn't know any better. So they're putting the show together with Buddy Holly as the sort of the the, uh, the top of the bill. Then out of the blue, he turned up on the biggest television show of that time, Sunday night at the London Palladium. The picture hasn't survived. All that remains is this fragment of soundtrack. I was watching that night at home on the end of Ride Pier. So were thousands of others all over the country. John Lennon and Paul McCartney in Liverpool, Mick Jagger and Keith Richards in Dartford, Eric Clapton in Surbiton, Elton John in Pinner. This was music that any beginner on the guitar could play. I, for one, couldn't wait. Now, everybody thinks because, you know, that you would have been staying in the very plush hotels. Not so. <laughs> they were okay, but they weren't, they weren't five-star hotels. And occasionally, was, you know, if there were hotels overbooked or whatever, we'd end up in, in lesser hotels. And a couple of occasions, I, I got to share a room with him because of room booking. So, yeah, you come in with me, Des, and you come in. And, we'd, and was, I think there was three of us sharing the room. And I'd, I'd have the job of dragging him out of bed in the mornings because Buddy was not an early riser. He was not. He hated to get up. And I remember once, because he was about six foot two, you know. You, yeah, six one, six two. And I remember grabbing him by the feet. Come on, we've got to get on the bus. He said, don't do that, Des. Don't pull my leg. I'm tall enough. <laughs> so even in the early hour of the morning, he had a sense of fun. He liked to laugh. During an overnight stay at the Grand Hotel Wigan, Buddy was attracted to one of the receptionists. Barbara Buller. Two days before he arrived, someone said to me, you know, Buddy Holly and the crickets are coming. And my reaction was, who is Buddy Holly? And uh, I'd never heard of rock and roll music because I was reared on classical music. So it's something that I didn't know anything about. And uh, Buddy Holly was just a name. It didn't really mean anything to me at all. During the course of the, the first afternoon that he was there, um, we obviously discussed all kinds of things. And he said, are you going to the show this evening? And I said, well, I hadn't really thought about it. And he said, oh, do come. And uh, so I went, more through curiosity than anything else. And the way they performed, it, it was just so very, very different. And the audience, they were screaming. And uh, there was the excitement went through the place, you know. And uh, it was just wonderful. It was just absolutely superb. I said I stood in the wings watching him. Well, uh, quite a lot of times I look and he was in the wings watching and listening to the human. It was two or three things he was doing. He was actually watching um, uh, a comedian working and he was listening to the delivery and the kind of jokes. And he'd say to me, you got the jokes for me, Des? And it's, it's hilarious. I would give him a joke, but only, I think I won't give him my best joke. I'd give him a, some dreadful joke. And he would go on, but in that southern drawl, it'd sound a lot funnier. I'm told he sent a letter saying that he was getting more laughs than the comic on the bill, which was me. What he didn't say was that I was giving him the jokes. <laughs> <laughs> After the show, we went back to the hotel. And really, it was a question of um, I couldn't stay there too long because I did have to go home. And last buses, you know, sort of had gone. Um, but he said, that's fine, I'll take you home. And we talked and we laughed. And we cuddled and we kissed. And he asked me if I would go to Liverpool to see him there. Um, I said, all being well, yes, I would. And I went to Liverpool. I didn't see the show. I just went to see him. He, he did say, uh, just tell him it's Barbara from Wigan and they will let you in. And I went to see him and um, the whole crew were there, of course. And once again, we talked and he said, Will you come on tour with me? Sadly, I had to say no. And it's ships that pass in the night. Maybe, baby, I'll have you. Maybe, baby, you'll be true. Maybe, baby, I'll have you for me. It's funny, honey, you don't care. You never listen to my prayer. Maybe, baby, you will love me someday. The thing was, 
we'd heard Buddy Holly on record over the radio and it was a totally amazing sound that came out absolutely blew us away the crunch was when we saw the photographs of Buddy Holly we just could not believe that this man in the photograph was making this music and until we actually saw him in the flesh you know we thought somebody's printing the wrong pictures here but when we saw him it was absolutely electrifying Buddy Holly was there for us in Sheffield. Well, after the show, I decided I wanted to meet this man. So I waited on the steps that you can see behind me. And at about 12.30, I decided, well, he's not going to show. So I set off to walk home. And as I walked off the steps, Buddy and the crickets appeared, and I basically walked through them. Stopped, turned around and shot back. I got the autographs, and we chatted for perhaps 20 minutes or more and uh, I got the impression he wasn't in a rush to get me out of the way he would have st stood and talked to me as long as I wanted it was the greatest thrill of my life and it stayed with me all these years I wasn't so lucky I never did get to see Buddy on stage during that tour but I could already play Maybe Baby on my Hofner guitar and anyway I felt sure he'd be back again before too long But his British tour wasn't just a turning point in my life. It was an even greater one, I discover, in his. Soon after returning to America, he married Maria Elena Santiago, a Puerto Rican four years older than himself, with typical impetuosity proposing to her on their very first date. Maria Elena worked in the music business and had her own strong ideas about the way Buddy's career should go. From the moment Buddy got married, he and Norman Petty started to drift apart. That bothered Norman very much that he married Maria Elena. Uh, that was not a marriage made in heaven as far as Norman Petty was concerned because that brought in an outsider. After all, she was working for the publishing company that was doing the publishing of her songs or helping Norman do it. The saddest thing to discover is that by the end of 1958, Buddy thought his career was tailing off. New songs like Well All Right were too subtle and unusual for the American charts though Britain's new buddy clones couldn't get enough of them. Why you buddy had broken away from Petty and stopped touring with the crickets. Living in Greenwich Village with Maria Elena, he went off in a completely new musical direction, becoming the first rock and roller to record with a full string orchestra. Sometimes we'll sigh Sometimes we'll cry And we'll know why Just you and I know true love I get the feeling from Buddy's ambitious future plans that he accepted his life as a rock and roll singer was over. He wanted to take up film acting, become a record producer, even build his own independent studio. To finance all this, he was counting on the royalties due to him from million sellers like That'll Be The Day and Peggy Sue. But I've discovered that they'd all been hived off into a special bank account under Petty's name, and Petty refused to pay them over. The truth was that by January 1959, Buddy was almost penniless. He had a Cadillac, you know, and a big, nice new Cadillac and doing pretty good, but he wasn't living high on the hog right then. He just, um, he needed to go on tour to make some money. And he didn't want to go on tour. That was the last tour. I get angry when I think what Buddy went through on that final tour. The winter dance party. Struggling through the frozen Midwest on a second-rate ballroom tour. Not stopping in one place for long enough even to get his clothes cleaned. Now I know what killed him. It wasn't booze or drugs or any of the usual rock star reasons. He chartered a plane to get into the next town early to get his laundry done. The sun is out, the sky is blue, 
There's not a cloud to spoil the view, but it's raining. Of course, I knew Buddy would be sitting in the first in the front seat anyway, because he was learning to fly. The Civil Aeronautics sent me the uh, whole report of how it happened. The best they could tell, they couldn't really tell exactly what happened. But I had an idea of what happened. I talked with the man that uh, chartered the plane to him. He said the pilot was a good pilot. We found out that he had taken an instrument test and had failed it, but he was a good pilot. But here's the thing. They had put a Sperry artificial horizon in the airplane a few days before, and this pilot hadn't flown with that in there. And they worked just backwards. One of them, the, the plane goes and the artificial horizon stays the same. And on the, on the one he'd been used to, the, the, the plane turns and, and, and the ground stays the same, just the opposite. So you read them completely backwards from what they, you would normally read when you're in them. I imagine the young pilot was pretty thrilled to be carrying some celebrities with him. And it was cold, and they got in that plane, closed the door, and just about the time they started breaking ground good and got up, well, it fogged over. You know how the condensation will do. It's just like wrapping a sheet around it, because he said, I've got my instruments. He starts looking at them instruments. But he read that artificial horizon backwards. I just nearly know he did, being a pilot. And that plane hit the ground and then bounced, and then come. it's like it, you know, not at a real steep attack, but like they didn't know that hit, they hit it going full speed, you know. Perhaps the most poignant memento of Buddy is the brown leather overnight bag he had with him when his plane went down. It now belongs to the founder of the Buddy Holly Memorial Society, Bill Griggs. Griggs looked inside it once and promised himself never to open it again, a vow he's kept until now. Show us a couple of the things that are in there. Yeah. Let's see what we got in here. Might, before we do that, there was a false bottom here where his buddy kept his pistol. And that was ripped out in the crash, and you can see the flat from the inside. But that's where the pistol was in the bottom of this leather bag. But we have things such as Buddy's toothpaste. We have a bottle of aspirin. We have a pair of his sunglasses. It's in a very tight case. It's hard to come out. My mom called me on the phone and told me that he had been killed in a plane crash. And it was it was very devastating news. I think the thing that hit me the most, if they're still there, is there's a comb and a brush. I can see them down there now, but there are a couple hairs. It's got to be Buddy's hair. Very sad. Very sad because he was too young to die. And he was too good. He made wonderful music. He was young. He was, he'd had everything to live for. Terribly, terribly sad. I heard the news that evening when I arrived at the end of Ride Pier to play Buddy Holly numbers at my father's rock and roll dance. His toothbrush. So it was all over, even though it had only just begun. See, the thing that gets me is, this is 59 dirt. I'm going to wash off my hands when I finish with this. And it's just, uh, it's the last thing he had in his hands. I had been with him three weeks before that. Everybody was hurt. You know, I just wish that I could have tied him and kept him with me, and he hadn't left. Because it was a great loss to the music world. It still is. The, the, the vacuum is there. It always will be, because can't nobody take his place. We know now that the music didn't really die on that snowy night in Iowa. Buddy's songs today are as irresistible to five-year-olds as to 50-year-olds. The Buddy musical has been playing for seven years in London's West End. He's become one of our patron saints. 
And I finally know the person I regarded as my friend all those years ago. I've discovered things about him that I never expected to. Things that some of his fans may not even want to believe. But as a being of flesh and blood, even more than as an idol, he seems to me to be a friend well worth having. I'm gonna tell you how it's gonna be. Are you gonna give your love to me? A love to last more than one day. A love is love and not pain. 